Rocket Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Shark Pod here. Uh, this is our, our third uh, tech founder in a row, so we're kind of going uh, tech based for, uh, for the foreseeable future, it seems. Uh, but uh, Joe Lennon, very happy to have you on the, the show here. How are you doing, Joe? Really good, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, looking forward to having the chat this morning. Yeah, and as ever, we've got uh, Mark Baker out there in Glenagary. How are you doing, Mark? Good, good. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Glenagary. What's it like down in Cork, Joe? It's actually beautiful down here as well, which is pretty rare. So <laughs> making the most of it by being inside recording a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, our, our Saturday morning as usual like this. Uh, but uh, uh, Joe is the, the co-founder uh, and CTO of WorkVivo. Uh, WorkVivo is a, a collaboration tool that was launched, I guess, like three years ago. Is that, that yeah, it was, it was, we, we started the company back in May 2017. Um, so when I say we started the company, we started a company, um, didn't necessarily uh, start work vivo. Then we were really trying to figure out what we wanted to build and what there was a market for and all of that kind of thing. And it, it was probably around July of that year that we really started to to work on work vivo as it is you know now. Um, we didn't really launch it to the market until like a year later in July of 2018. So yeah, so I, I suppose we're we're out there for two years, but we've been working on it for for just over three years. Incredible, because it seems like it's been, when I was looking at the the marketing stuff, it seems like it's been around for a long time. How would you describe uh, the business to people who haven't heard of WorkVivo or um, you kind of want to learn more about that? What would be the, how would you encapsulate that? Yeah, so it's it's essentially it's an internal communications platform uh, for companies that's been designed around the things that are important for increasing engagement in, in, in organizations. So, um, really what we try to do is um, reinforce a company's positive culture in a digital way, um, which is obviously becoming more and more important these days. Um, and we do so by, you know, not just giving employees the tools that they need to communicate with each other, connect to each other and collaborate with each other, but also doing so in a way that shows, you know, just, just how everybody in an organization is actually contributing to the overall goals and values of the, of the company. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. I mean, to give you like a very like loose analogy, it's probably like a combination of a social network and an internet. Uh, it's kind of like a modern internet solution with a lot of social features as well. So, um, what a what a great time to have something like this. It's such a like this. What I, I worry about a little bit. We're all uh, working from home right now for the foreseeable future in a hope spot. Anyway, um, yep. until like we have kind of a, a soft. Uh, you know, re-entry January, we're going to see how things are then. Uh, and then people are going to have to make a decision about what type of worker they want to be, completely remote or kind of hot desking. Like there's a lot of, uh, you know, it, a lot of decisions to be made there. Um, but what was great about working for HubSpot is the, I know it's kind of like a, you know, an overused term, like the the culture piece, but we actually did have a great culture. It was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, like people liked going to the office. Um, it wasn't just about the the beer taps and the the you know, the free nuts. It was, yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the atmosphere there was always really positive. Um, and it was great to like, I would meet people in work that were not in my, not in sales and it might be in tech and we'd have like, uh, you know, a discussion about how we could make things better, all that type of stuff. That's all a little bit lost now. Um, yeah, so- ab- absolutely. And I think, you know, there's like, obviously there's a lot of communications tools out there and, you know, we're using, you know, we're using one right now, Zoom. Um, you've got tools like Slack, which we use internally for, you know, that kind of real time operational communications where you need to have conversations with people. You need to really just engage on the kind of the day to day activities. And usually when you're chatting to people on Slack or, or you know, you're having video calls with, um, with, with people on Zoom, it's very much, you know, the people that you know in the organization, the people that you're closest to. Um, whereas I think what's missing is that kind of overall, um, you know, tool to en- enable you to communicate with people across the entire business. And, w- and we're seeing that like on a massive scale with, with some organizations that, <clears throat> you know, aren't tech companies like ourselves. Um, uh, they, you know, they're not your traditional kind of desk-based worker. You, you know, you've got organizations like Woody's, for example, right, who have, um, you know, retail stores all over the country, all over the UK. Um, and for them, you know, the people who work in Woody's don't typically interact with people who work in other stores, right? So, you know, yes, there's there's definitely an element of culture and everything within individual stores, but there's an overarching goal and, uh, you know, for Woody's, the organization, there's overarching values that uh, apply across the organization. The people working in each of these retail stores, you know, are, are working towards the same mission, but they don't necessarily know that they're doing it with each other because they don't see each other every day and they, they never meet. So what platforms like WorkVivo allow you to do 
essentially is to open up that um, that that culture and open up that positivity. And I think positive is is positivity is, is one of those things that is, is so important right now. And um, we all know we need operational tools. We all know we need tools to get, you know, stuff done on a day-to-day basis. Um, but it's that kind of overarching like positivity message. It's the seeing all of the good things that are happening around the company that you that you get when you're in the office. Um, that's what tools like WorkVivo are, are, are all about. It's, it's what I, th- I think it's probably for the best as in people's lifestyle they can kind of build around uh, if they're working from home a little bit more, which is great. Yeah. But I, I think I will go down to the, the different uh, personalities as well. I don't know, Mark Baker, do you think, uh, do, do you miss the office at all? Do you, I don't know, for, for you to keep in a... You know, yeah, Joe, there's, there's, there's four of us in my company. So we're a recru- finance recruitment company. Mm-hmm. We're based in, in Dublin city centre and paying uh, the rent you'd expect Dublin City Centre to be, yeah. still paying it, even though I haven't been there since March. So it's, it's, it's been working actually really, really well, but there's only four of us, mm-hmm. you know, we're, but we're a, we're a kind of a growth company. We want to grow. Um, so it, while it works okay now, look, the only reason we're in town, really, the main reason is to meet people, to have coffees, to ha- meet candidates, meet clients. That's not happening. That's just not happening right now. So yeah. The likes of this is is Zoom and Teams is is the replacement for that. And look, our competitors aren't doing it either. So there's no advantage being lost. Yeah. Yeah. So the main thing we were saying is the, the the culture, the banter. Well, one strategy and stuff like that with my business partner, you, you kind of need to be in the same room sometimes. But it is the you'd miss the if you were to do continue on to be full time to let the lease go and just can you can you to be full time from home. There would be definitely a culture that's lost there. So it's, it's, it's interesting that that is the main thing that we've been talking about that's missing, you know, that, that you know, um, and I, I assume it's the same for most companies. And to grow a company, it's okay if you have, say if you had 10 employees and it's like, yeah, you all know each other, you got to know each other, you're, you're working on teams, it's fine. But what about if you want 20, 30, 40? What about the new people? It's okay for current companies what they have, but how do you, you don't. You won't know your new members of staff. How do you get to know them if you can't physically be with them? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you know we've 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 had that challenge ourselves, right? So I mean, when when the pandemic started, we I think we had fifteen people. You know, we've now almost doubled in size since that, um, or since then. Um, so there's you know a big part of our company. Nearly half of our workforce have you know never worked in the office. You know, they've never yeah. been based in the office. They all started their first day you know, in their bedroom at home or, you know, in their, in their home office. So, and it's a totally new dynamic. And I know there's been a lot of companies that have been working this way very successfully for many years, but I think what's, you know, what's really different is that there's been two shifts. There's been companies have had to shift to being, you know, not only open to because they have to know, um, but being able to onboard people effectively in a remote setting. That's the first thing. But then it's also for the people starting in new roles. So, you know, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a large population out there who have always, you know, wanted to work from home, who've, who've you know, had roles that are remote based and so on. And they've, you know, over, the, over years have built up this, um, you know, kind of efficient work practice that allows them to do that successfully, that allows them to join a new company successfully and so on. But for the people who don't have that experience, it's been very challenging for them because they've been thrust into this, you know, whether they like it or not, that, you know, now you want to start a new job, you know, you're going to be doing that remotely. Especially like, obviously there's, you know, there's plenty of jobs out there that aren't, you know, always, they don't have the luxury of being able to work remotely, but I mean, you know, we do. But I think what's been really interesting has been like the kind of response that, you know, you've seen people take, to that, both at a company level and at a personal level. So like you've seen companies obviously been catapulted, catapulted into it, um, whether they liked it or not. And I think a lot of, there was a lot of fear at the start that, you know, how are we actually going to continue to operate? I think then we saw the kind of, the kind of next wave of it where companies actually started to think, you know what, this is actually great. It's actually like, we're quite efficient. You know, there's a lot of um, the day-to-day things that maybe go on in an office that have slowed down a little bit. And I think now it's interesting, you know, the conversations I'm having with people, we're, we're seeing a lot of things like Zoom meeting fatigue and, you know, people just, you know, sick of being in the one location all day long. They're kind of, you know, they're, they're almost working more than they ever did um, because of that kind of always being connected thing. You know, and I think a lot of tech workers have, you know, and, and companies, people working in tech companies, you know, like HubSpot, like WorkVivo and so on, have always kind of felt like they're always connected because, 
you know, it's, it's a tech business, you know, we use digital tools. If you want to check your email at two in the morning, you can. But I think a lot of people weren't doing that for the longest time. And now that they're working from home, you know, they're finding that they're doing things like that. Um, and obviously that's, you know, maybe great at the start and, you know, it works okay and they're happy with that because it's kind of that work-life dynamic. You can, you know, maybe work a little bit later in the evening, but, you know, play with your kids for a few hours in the morning. Um, but over time, I think, you know, what you're finding and like certainly what, you know, um, like we did a survey recently of, um, of a thousand people across the, the US and the UK. And it was really interesting to see the results on there in, um, in terms of, you know, what people are, are really thinking. And I think, you know, there's definitely people, people want, like people want the option now, um, but they don't necessarily you know, want to be 100% remote. So it's kind of interesting to see that play out. And then with companies, it's, you know, I think companies are starting to relook at their strategy around, you know, where they're located. I mean, we, we've, we have this problem ourselves, right? Where like our office in, in Douglas and Cork, um, you know, when we, you know, closed down for the pandemic, as I said, we were, you know, 15 or 16 people we have capacity for 20 in our office. So, you know, now we've outgrown that. Um, so if we wanted to go back to the office full time, we now need to figure out what we're going to do about that, you know? So, and, but the reality is, is that because of the, 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 the mix between, you know, both how companies are perceiving, you know, and, and changing and adapting to all of this and how people are, I think we're, we're starting to see, you know, what the future is actually going to look like, start to unfold. And it, it, it's, it's going to be some kind of a hybrid, you know, it's going to be people will want, like people are loving that flexibility, but, you know, they're trying to figure out how to get around the kind of negative bits um, of it. And companies are doing the same. So I think we're kind of getting on to that stage of it. And it's going to be really interesting to see over the, over the next few months, especially as winter yeah. kicks in, because that's going to change. That's going to bring a whole new dynamic, right? So, <laughs> yeah, it's okay if you can go for a nice, like, nice seaside walk on your, your lunch break for you know, an hour and a half or something. Uh, but if you're, yeah. if you're locked in the house for days on end and you haven't uh, done anything, it might be a different, different vibe altogether. No, I... One thing I noticed as well would be new employees kind of they're buy into the company. It's not mm. gonna, you're not going to be as connected to the company if you haven't actually been in there with your colleagues. There's an employee retention rate that's going to have to be looked at. You know, if if someone could join and they just might leave a month later if they don't like it, if they haven't invested. You know, so I think something like Work Vivo with the culture that will bring will be will be a huge part for employee retention rates. I'd imagine that's something you've you've thought about. No, absolutely. And I mean the whole like when we look at some of the benefits of, you know, helping to increase engagement in companies, yeah, whether it's through a comms platform like ourselves or through other means, you know, one of the the key things about getting engagement right is that, you know, when employees are engaged, they stay. You know, they, they you you find it easier to retain people. Um and like that all kind of comes back to, you know, I, I guess, you know, what the um, important things are for, for driving engagement in an organization, right? And it's, you know, obviously you've got like the basic stuff, like people need to be, you know, paid fairly and, you know, they need to be treated well and, and things like that. But it's more so, I think, the thing that companies so often get wrong and the reason why engagement is, is typically quite low, you know, especially across large organizations, is that people don't feel connected to like not just the company, but to what the company is actually trying to achieve. So like, what am I doing on a day-to-day -day basis in my job that's actually contributing on a meaningful level that's moving this company in the right direction in terms of what it's trying to achieve. And that's like what we have built WorkVivo to try and help with is to try and show everybody, you know, like all of the good things that are happening, including the things that they're doing, you know, through things like colleague recognition, um, you know, shout outs, things like that. Um, to like really just reinforce like all of the positive impact that people across the business are having on the business itself, not just on, you know, the tasks that they are being assigned to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, like the, the reaction that we've had to the platform since we launched it in the companies that we've, we've gone live with to date has just been overwhelmingly positive. And, you know, in many ways, you know, that positivity is like, obviously look, it's a platform that allows them to achieve that, but it's it's in how they're using it you know it's how they're putting it into in, into play and you know that's something that we've been really really mindful of since day one is yes it's a software platform yes it's a tool yes it's a piece of technology but if it's not implemented or used you know in in an appropriate way then you're not going to get the benefits out of it so we you know we work tirelessly with our customers to ensure that you know they are 
you know, constantly just reinforcing that positivity, using the tools that are there within WorkVivo to keep driving that message. And when they do, like the results are, are you know, massively positive for, for the company as a whole. Um, so, yeah, it's, I think, and I think like I, I, I ramble on about positivity because I think positivity is something that's like, you know, really, really important right now. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's so much negativity going on in the everyday, everyday world that it's just so easy for that to creep in to work life as well, right? Where, you know, if all you're hearing on the news every day is number of cases, you know, and, you know, it's the same kind of thing over and over again, it's very easy for that to kind of creep into work. And I think it's really important that when you're at work, like when good things are happening, that you know about it and you see it front and center every day. I, I yeah. think it's positivity, we, it's such an important part of, uh, kind of mental health for everybody. Like you said, like me and Mark talked about this uh, off air as well, about the, about the news where, you know, they have the running total going on. Mm. Running total, it's like, you know, it it just kind of brings people down a little bit. It's kind of like, okay, well, that's that's never going to go down now. It's only going to go up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's no yeah. way to win on that number. But um, it's very interesting. Like when you guys were, were getting started when you were, cause, all right, so this is, that's, uh, when you guys getting started, it's probably 2018, you said it's kind of launching. A different world back there. I think things were, especially in Ireland, really doing well. It felt like another kind of boom uh, in, in a lot of ways coming back or Wilbur was back. Um, and when you were thinking about this, like where did the idea come from? Was it something that you'd seen in other organizations that you were the CTO of? I saw that on LinkedIn that you've got CTO in a few different companies and there was an issue with that type of, uh, that type of platform missing or how were they? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I suppose it goes back to the story of myself and, and my co-founder John Goulding and you know, how, you know, we met first day and, you know, the, the, the relationship we, we built. Um, so we, we, we essentially joined a company called Core HR um, back in 2007. I think it was, it was definitely around the same time um, as each other. Now, John, John is, you know, has a background um, in, you know, working for Dell EMC as, a, as, as head of global support. Um, you know, I was a recent grad um, when I joined Core HR, right? So we were joining in very different capacities. But over the years, like I stayed in, I was working in Core for, close to seven years, um, we had a very strong working relationship there. Now, in terms of what Core HR does, essentially it's, it's, pay, it's enterprise level payroll and HR software. Um, so we were seeing, you know, through the customers that we had in Core HR over that time. And, you know, John worked there for, for a number of years after I, I left, um, what the pain points were around, you know, companies and, and large and, and, and enterprise level companies. Um, <clears throat> and over the years, you know, that we were, Working in Core HR, we, we we really see we really saw a number of shifts in terms of like where the challenges lay. Um, so, you know, the, historically, like recruitment is obviously a, a, an ongoing challenge for every organization. But you know, kind of on the um, flip side of that, you have talent, talent management and retention. And um, you know, we were building tools within within Core HR at the time to try and help with that. Um, but then, kind of almost. You know, fighting against that, you had, you know, things around performance management and, you know, how do you make sure that people are working effectively and you're getting the most out of them and, you know, things like that. And what we've seen, I think, over the years is that the situation is nearly reversed in that, like, traditionally, especially in big companies, traditionally, they were so focused, like, their, their main focus was on, are the people who are working here doing well? And are, you know, are they performing well? Um, and it's almost flipped to the reverse now where it's the people in the business that are looking at the company and it's like, is the company doing well as an employer? And, you know, do I want to stay here? Should I stay here? And we were seeing this kind of really unfold over, over the entire time that we were working in, in, in core. Um, and when we sync back up, so we, we kind of like John, John left core HR in, in early 2017 and we met, we met up for a coffee and we were chatting about things and, um, you know, we were talking about all the different types of business that you know if we were to start something what would we start and you know we 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 had ideas around recruitment we had ideas um around different hr things but um employee engagement was the thing that we knew like from our time at core that really remained an unsolved problem um it was one of those things that everybody has like i mean gallup have been publishing research on like lack of engagement in the workplace since the 1970s. And to be honest, the message hasn't really changed massively since then. Um, but I think companies have definitely shifted to focus on it a lot more um, over the last number of years. Um, so, you know, it's, it's funny. It's like we, we'd even go into um, like the, back at the very start, kind of in late 2017, early 2018, we'd be going into companies to talk to them about engagement. And in many organizations, they actually had like a team 
for employee engagement, but they didn't really have any tools at their disposal, right? So, um, so like really where the idea kind of came from was obviously based on, on our experience and, you know, what we had seen in, you know, the HR market. Um, but it was also based on talking to, to companies, right? So, you know, we, when we talked with, um, the, the earliest customers that we brought on. So, you know, we had, we had pilot customers kind of in late 2017, Morgan McKinley, um, you know, recruitment company that have offices here in, in Dublin, Cork and, and elsewhere. And then obviously across the world as well. Now, um, we talked to them very early on. We talked to Staffordshire University, big university in the UK, up in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, we talked to Trigon Hotels, which is a, a, a collection of three hotels in Cork. And we talked to Voxpro, um, who were acquired by TELUS International there um, a couple of years ago. Um, you know, big global outsourced uh, support company. Very, very different companies, but the resounding message from all of them was the same. It was that engage, like lack of engagement is a real problem that we you know, need to focus on and we need to make sure we get right so that we you know, not just get the best people on board, but that we keep them engaged and, and we keep them. Um, and, you know, we worked really closely with, with all, all of those organizations before launching the, the product um, to the market to ensure that, you know, what we were building was going to actually make a real difference on that engagement front. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of really like how it all came about. I mean, you know, I know a lot of founders, you know, wake up with, you know, the idea in one morning and I've, I've, I've been there, right? I've, I've, I've had that in the past where like I woke up one morning with a burning desire to build something um, and I went and built it and it ultimately failed. Um, and uh, yeah, this time it was definitely a lot more kind of logical and a bit more structured in terms of how we approached it. And, that, and it's worked out really well for us. So that's, that's really like, it's, it's opening the There's so many different ways of uh, coming up with things. I remember last week we, we had um, Mark Tanner from uh, Quiller. Uh, he joined us from Sydney. And he was saying that he just kind of met his co-founder, like they used to be friends like back in the day or something like that. And he, uh, he met him at a wedding that he had traveled back to. And then now they have this big company out there in Sydney. So like it's very, uh, it can just happen very quickly. Okay. But uh, so when you, when you guys, okay, you figured out the kind of the, the fit for the market. You, you've seen that in core, you've come across a lot of these challenges. Like when the go to market, that's what I'm always really interested in because it's kind of what I do with my partners as well. We, we build this, this kind of, uh, the machine with the product and marketing all that type of stuff, but the actual go to market. Were you were you focused on uh, any industries in, in particular, or was the strategy more like geography, like say UK or looking at the uh, US? How did you guys go about that at the, at the beginning? Yeah, so at the, at the very beginning, it was really you know just leveraging our own network, right? So you know making sure that we got to the to, to organizations that we could make an impact in, that we had a good connection into. So because. Like one of the one of the challenges of selling enterprise software, and you know, we when we started off, we set some kind of guiding principles for like what kind of side of the market we wanted to build for. Was it going to be small companies? Was it going to be large companies? You know, was it going to be in specific sectors and so on? Um, and one of the things that we landed on was that look, our experience is in is in building and selling enterprise software, so that's where we should focus. Um, so it was going to be you know companies with five hundred or more employees. We're going to be our target customer for whatever we built. Um, so with that, you know, really like selling enterprise software is it's it's challenging, right? It's it's very challenging, and if you're going in cold, it's even more challenging. So, you know, from our core HR days, and you know, through through our own I suppose experience over over the kind of ten to twenty years prior, we we obviously had a lot of contacts, and we had a lot of people who we could reach out to in some you know, really meaningful organizations. So it was it was very opportunistic from that perspective at the start. And um, so after we, you know, kind of rolled out the pilot customers or rolled out to the pilot customers and had success there, um, you know, a lot of the early growth that we would have had would have been not necessarily targeting a specific industry, but targeting, pe you know, people we knew and, and, you know, people we, you know, could reach within different organizations. Because if you can get in at a senior level early on, you're going to have a lot more um, potential to actually to, to make an impact there. Um, that being said, I mean, you know, like, so one of the things I guess that we wanted to ensure as well was that like we're building WorkVivo as a tool, you know, not just for um, a specific industry. Like it's a, it's a product that, you know, could essentially help any company with their, with their internal communications and with engagement. And we wanted to prove that the product would work in different settings. So even even looking at our, our pilot customers, like Trigon Hotels is a great example. You know, it's like like the example I gave of Woody's earlier on about how um, you know people in different um, stores didn't know each other. It was the same in, in in Trigon Hotels. Like people in the different hotels didn't know each other. They like a lot of them now 
like have friendships and they have connections to people working in other hotels. Like they, they gave, the, they did a, a really good testimonial, testimonial video for us a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, one of the things that they talked about was like how their kitchen staff in the different kitchens would have competitions on like who could come up with the best dishes and post them on work vivo. And, you know, that's, that's yeah. the kind of, um, like the, um, the thing that really kind of, I think guides you. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we knew it could work like in everything from a hotel group right up to a, you know, a tech company. Um, and I think, as I said, kind of kicking on from there, you know, the growth was very kind of opportunistic. So again, we were, you know, we were trying to push on from, um, like we, we had a lot of success early on with companies, you know, Morgan McKinney had about 800 people when we started, Box Pro around 4,000. Um, you know, we wanted to kick on and see, could, could we deliver at, at a larger scale? Um, and, you know, kind of early, in, early enough in 2018, we, we actually won a contract with a large multinational organization to roll the, 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 the product out to their 40,000 people around the world. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, even, even getting your company ready to support that yeah. is, is a major challenge. Um, but it's, I suppose it's one of the, the, the things about enterprise software is that, you know, it's, it's a long road to winning, but when you win, you win big and, you know, you, it can make a real impact on your company and then you can, you can grow from that. And I think that like a lot of that comes into, I suppose, our strategy around how to build a company. So, I mean, when you talk about go to market, I think it's not even just go to market. It's about like, how are we going to fund the business? How are we going to, you know, grow it? And, like our, our early strategy around growth and funding was that it was going to be um, self-funded. It was going to essentially, you know, fund itself through revenue and through customer growth. And we, you know, were able to do that. We were able to reach, you know, cash flow positivity, profitability, and all of that kind of thing within two years, which was, um, you know, for, for as well for a tech company, it's it's not very normal <laughs> to do that. Um, but sorry, sorry, Luke. Uh, HubSpot's still trying to get there. I think. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, so it, that so at the beginning you were saying we're going to bootstrap it for want of a better word and uh, get it to profitability. Um, then I, I I know that uh, you got uh, the, actually the first rate, maybe I, I mentioned that uh, Barry uh, Nyan was the one who kind of um, put you guys on my radar when he started working there. An old friend from HubSpot. Shout out to Barry if he's listening. He tried to set this up as well. Um, so we might get Barry on, have a chat with him. Hey, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But uh, what was I going to say there? Yeah, so the the, guy, the creator of Zoom uh, or the, the founder of Zoom um, invested in you guys as well. And that's when I, that was on 6-1 News here. For the non-Irish listener, 6-1 News is kind of like the news that everybody watches. It's kind of like a you know, monopoly there. And I've seen uh, you guys on that one. And I, when, when that guy uh, invests in you, that's a kind of a, almost a seal of approval. I don't know like how much it was, if it was a meaningful amount for you guys, but it's kind of, it puts, it makes people uh, kind of notice this is something that's going to be big in the future. How did that come about? Did they? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, like that whole conversation um, started through a mutual customer. So we were, we were introduced um, through a customer who was, you know, a big customer of Zooms, but also, you know, our biggest customer. Um, so we, we got connected that way. And it's funny, like when we went into that conversation, we weren't looking for an investor, you know, we were just obviously like wanted to like have a conversation with somebody, you know, who, who had so much success and, you know, anything that we could learn from, from somebody like him would be, um, of benefit to us, but we were also, you know, could we get Zoom as a customer? Could we get them as yep. a, as a partner, you know, would there be, would there be some kind of, um, thing that we could do together? Um, so we jumped on a, you know, like on a call with them essentially showed them our products and like at the end of it, it was, how do I invest? Um, yeah. So it, that, that, that's how it kind of came about. I mean, we weren't really, like, as I said, we were at that time, we were actually cash flow positive. So we didn't necessarily need funding. Um, but when somebody like that, you know, basically says they want to become an investor, it, it, it definitely starts changing your thinking. And, you know, we, through conversations with him, I mean, both myself and John are like massively ambitious people. I mean, Corey Charles was a huge success story. Um, you know, John was CEO there when, when they were acquired, the first time they were acquired back in 2015. Um, you know, we, we have massive ambition. I think when we kind of started off Work Vivo, a big part of our, like an early mindset was, you know, we wanted to build a sustainable company, a profitable company, um, rather than getting into that kind of high growth, high growth mindset right from the very start. But that was always kind of in, in there, right? Kind of ready, ready and waiting to come out. Um, and through conversations with Eric, you know, we, we kind of found ourselves really levitating back towards that, you know, we're onto something here. We've got, you know, a really successful business as it stands today and we can keep going the way we're going and make some profit and, you know, everybody be happy. But 
we, we really feel like we can make a real impact on communications across the world, you know, and, and, you know, like we genuinely believe that Work Vivo can be, you know, as, as big a name out there as, as the likes of Slack or Zoom or, you know, one of these, one of these platforms. Um, so yeah, it was through, through those conversations where like, he's obviously thinking, on a whole other scale of, of big, right? I mean, you know, you probably saw like their stock price last week just shot up and it's um, it's been incredible. Obviously the growth that they've had over the last kind of six months with the pandemic as well, but even before that they were flying. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of like how that all kind of came came to be. And you're right, I mean, so like when, when we announced that and when, we, when we've shared that news, it's like, if you're looking to send like a positive signal to investors, like, that's about as positive a signal as you can possibly send yeah. is, you know, the founder of one of the most successful tech companies in the world right now is like, in, is personally investing in you. Um, so it was interesting because I, I, like I mentioned earlier, right. I, like I, I've been through failed startups in the past and um, I remember, you know, those days, you know, trying to even just like get a cup of coffee with an investor and, you know, just trying to even get them to respond to an email and you were like, spraying and praying that like anybody would like listen to you and and hear your story and hear your idea and give you some cash um and it was funny that like it essentially was like the opposite of that um after we broke the news um about that investment and you know we were like basically had inundated with like meeting requests from vcs and and investors across like silicon valley you know the east coast of the us and europe um and it was really like it was really interesting and I suppose all, all, all the while, you know, we, we were in the back rooms, like having a lot of conversations about, you know, where do we go? You know, like, okay, we've taken on the, the investment from, from Eric, but, you know, do we want to go down that path of raising a big series A, going down, you know, potentially series B and, and beyond? Um, or, you know, do we want to just keep going the way we're going? So there was a lot of conversations around that, but ultimately, you know, we were going and talking to some of the investors um, and, and yeah, we did, we decided that like, it was too big an opportunity, you know, that the product was was so well received by the customers that we had that, you know, if we could take that and, and grow it out um, to what we knew we were capable of, that, you know, it, there wasn't any other, <laughs> there wasn't any other right answer, right? So. No, interesting. I wonder as well, because it's there. So when this is all happening, are you guys uh, tempted to pull like an intercom and go over there to be, you know, get your place in Sausalito over there in uh, or Silicon Valley and uh, and move the whole o- operation there. It, was that ever something that kind of came up? I know a lot of some Irish companies have done that striping one. Right? Yeah, and no. So, so like, I think, you know, as it stands today, like our strategy right now is to still build and grow from Ireland. Um, now, that when I say that, I mean, we, like we, do, we already have people working in WorkVivo in the US, in, uh, in, in California. Um, but it would be part of our business rather than our entire operation. So, um, you know, we've, we've, we've built a good solid base here in, in, in Cork and we will continue to build that. Um, we'll obviously build, you know, sales um, in particular. Um, and marketing over in the US as well, and 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 indeed in other locations as we grow. Um, but I think you know, to be honest, like the last number of months has obviously been pretty eye-opening in terms of um, you know the, the the ways that you can build a global business from any location. And yeah, like it's obviously it's worked really well for Intercom, it's worked really well for Stripe um, to to just completely move um, their their kind of main operations over there. Um, but for us, I think you know we've. Like it's definitely going to be a combination of like, you know, keeping, keeping it close to home, but then like just growing outwards as well. And, and having like, I think the remote story as well, it's like, you know, we're hiring people more and more, not based on location, but just based on, you know, who's the best person for the, for the role. And I think, you know, that's, it's going to be interesting to see how we kind of progress that once, you know, the option of having, you know, full-time people in an, in an office is kind of back again. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's enough. Ask me again in 18 months, but um, yeah. yeah, for for now it's, you know, I think, as I said, we're, um, we're, we're, we're set up well to grow from here. Um, and, you know, with, with all of the, the, the kind of remote uh, approaches that we have at our disposal, it, you know, there's no reason for that to change in the foreseeable future. And Cork, there's loads of stuff going on in Cork right now. I don't know what's going on there. I wonder it's because of the big EMC uh, thing that's been there for a long time, uh, the Apple uh, investment's been there for a long time as well. Is like 
there seems to be per capita a lot more kind of, of these types of companies coming out of there. Um, teamwork, also a massive uh, success mm-hmm. there. There seems to be loads going on there. Or do you think it's, is it the, just that the IT's there are good or what's, what's uh, going on in Cork where people are, you know, starting these type of companies? Yeah, like, like Cork has, has always had, um, you know, a pretty good reputation from a tech perspective. As you mentioned, you know, the likes of Dell EMC being based here for, you know, 40 years and Apple, you know, have, have a very rich history in Cork, um, you know, over the years as well. And have, have always been a big employer here in Cork. Um, but beyond that, I mean, you know, you're, you have a lot of very large tech employers um, down here. You know, the, there's a big cybersecurity kind of like, hub essentially um down in cork as well where you've got you know a lot of the major uh, cybersecurity firms based down here like your fire eyes your mcafee's your uh, malwarebytes and, and so on have always had a, a like or have recently had a very strong presence here um so i think that's the, like that's definitely um a driver of it um i think you know a lot of the 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 companies like so you mentioned like teamwork i mean teamwork are a, f- a fantastic success story um from cork um you know bootstrapped um you know kind of grew um, over the years, but have really just exploded over the last number of years as well in terms of their growth. Um, you know, we, we'd know Peter and Dan very well. This was one of the, one of the great things about Cork, <laughs> pure Cork person thing to say there, um, is, uh, is, is that it is quite small. I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not anywhere near as kind of large as Dublin in terms of the kind of the, the spread, I guess. Um, so it means, you know, when there, when there are founders here, it's, everybody kind of knows each other um, and we have a pretty solid network there. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the, the tech story in Cork definitely kind of plays into that, but I think as well, you know, it's, there's definitely kind of a slower pace here um, than there probably is in Dublin, but we still probably have all of the facilities and the amenities and everything that you need to run a successful business. We've got good connections in terms of the airport. It's, you know, I, I used to joke that, um, you know, I could hop on a plane and be in the center of London faster than I can be in the center of Dublin. Um, you know, and it's, so there's, I think, you know, we're pretty well placed to, to um, succeed. Um, and for startups, I think, you know, it's not perfect. I mean, I definitely wouldn't say like, there's, we definitely have challenges. And I think a lot of our challenges are around the kind of distribution of companies around the city. Like we don't really have like a centralized like a lot of the startup activity that happens in Cork is, is not necessarily in the city centre. It's it tends to be in pockets around the city, um, and that makes it hard to kind of build a community. Um, so, but that being said, you know, as I said, it's um, it's a pretty good place, and we don't have like the traffic problems and the <laughs> everything else that goes that goes with larger cities. Um, so I think it just it, it does help a lot. Does me sound that well, Joe? Yeah, exactly. We're all going to move to Cork now and uh, get our. <laughs> Definitely, um, yeah. There's loads of jobs down here. So. <laughs> yeah. Me and Mark have talked about this before. We were, we, all right, we, like, like you said, there's lots and lots of um, uh, success stories for sure out of Ireland from a, a tech point of view. But because it's been like the, the, the center of, a, like, um, of all of these you know, giant tech companies um, in and around the country you would imagine that there'd be so many spin-offs from people who have worked in these types of companies, maybe worked in Google. They see the best practices in tech. You know, they see gaps that um, are too small perhaps for like a HubSpot to, to put investment into, but it could be a really good business for, you know, mm-hmm. a small startup that can grow. So it is kind of curious to me that it's been kind of 20 years where there, there, I feel like there should be a lot more. Like if you look at like places like Israel, everyone, they're popping up all the time. Uh, I went to Berlin. I had a, a, a partner there and we were I met up with these guys who were uh, in the startup world who were listening off. I know that's a bigger city and that type of thing, but I don't know. I, I just feel like we're... Yeah, like, I, th- <clears throat> I think, I, I think that, like there's definitely gaps in terms of like, you know, where we are as a company and not as a company, where we are as a country with regards to um, being well set up for, for, for startups. I mean, we have a lot of things that are really, really strong, but I think it, like one of probably the biggest issues is around investment. And I mean, where in some ways we have fantastic facilities in Ireland for um, companies to get off the ground, you know, Enterprise Ireland are a phenomenal organization. Um, you know, even like local authorities in terms of the, some of the funding supports that are available, like fantastic and, and like really do enable people to start business. But I think, you know, that's like all well and good, but like, you know, for, the, for those local um, like grants that you can get and things like that, it's like, that's really only gets you off the ground. It's like to kick on to the next stage, you need that extra funding. And 
like Enterprise Ireland, like, I mean, you know, they're a backer of, of Work Vivo, you know, we're under HPSU program and they've been fantastic with us. But, you know, you're, you're not going to get an Enterprise Inve Ireland investment on its own. You need you need an investor to go along with that, right? So you need that um, match funding and, and everything else that goes with it. And so we have all the supports that we need. We have all of that kind of infrastructure there. But what we don't have is is the investors. I mean, you know, there's like there are some really good VCs like Frontline Ventures and so on in, in Ireland, but the number is very small. And I think even the angel community and everything else that goes with it, it again means that companies like ourselves, and I think, you know, if you look at all of the kind of major Series A investments that have been announced this year, like the vast majority of the investment in those companies has come from the US. Um, and that's I think what's probably been inhibiting the growth of of startups in Ireland is is you know, lack of capital. And I think as well, you know, we've been, I think you can read, um, I know like there's a whole organization scale Ireland now that have been kind of set up to, to try and help tackle some of the challenges that we have in, in fostering innovation and enterprise in, in the country. Um, but, you know, I think we, we do like need to seriously think about um, the incentives that are there as well for people to actually start businesses. You know, in, in, for many, many years, we've been penalizing people for, you know, being self-employed and, um, you know, the um, the lack of, I suppose, incentive as well in terms of like capital gains breaks and things like that, that you see in the likes of the UK, where, you know, if you if you were to exit a business, there's, you know, significant tax incentives there for, you know, that sale. And in Ireland, you know, we have incentives, but they're like on a whole other, like they're an order of magnitude smaller. Um, and I think that's 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 probably the thing that's missing the most is that kind of funding story and that government like levels kind of story. I think you know, as I said, some really really great things, but we definitely still have gaps. It's, it's, we came up with um, it's interesting you say that because one of our other guests from Renatus Capital, um, uh, John or sorry, uh, Mark Flood, uh, he was saying that as well because he, he's obviously he's a so he works in a private equity, so he works with a lot of founders, and that's kind of one of the biggest problems is where people don't really want to dispose their assets because they're going to be hit so so hard for capital games. So they'll just kind of like sit on it, even though if, like, if they had sold that to somebody else that had capital, it would take it on and they could hire more people. But it's kind of like almost uh, like people have to make a decision to say, okay, do I going to give half of this away? Or can I just, uh, you know, it, it's fine where it is and it will just be making profitable business, but not reaching its full potential. So it's not just about, you know, making sure people can get rich at the end of the day. Uh, I think it's about, you know, for keep, keeping that flow of capital, make sure that it's like uh, these companies are getting, uh, hiring the most people possible um, and also yeah. being run by people who want to want to see them be bigger, you know? No, exactly. And I, and I think like a lot of the incentives that you do see come out of government are probably stuck in the past a little bit in terms of like the, like they're very much driven by corporation tax breaks and, you know, R&D credits and things like that, right? For, because typically in the past, I mean, starting, an enterprise in Ireland or anywhere, you know, involved quite a lot of like capital expenditure and, and kind of research and development investment and so on. And then obviously you have like companies ultimately are, are, are trying to be profitable, but, you know, putting, putting breaks on corporation taxes, you know, in the first three years of a startup's life, 95% of startups are never going to be profitable in the first three years. So those kind of initiatives are like, they're great sound bites, but they're completely meaningless in terms of the practical applicability to companies you know that are that are trying to get off the ground and it's it's as you said it's a, it needs to be shifted more to seeing like innovation and startups as being a huge source of employment in this country and i think you know that is like that is real you know that's actually happening even without that kind of um, level of support and that's what the focus needs to be on is like how, how do we enable all of these companies to create employment and to ensure that you know we we are um, are supporting them to do that because that's the biggest challenge for any company I think especially in tech it's uh, you know when you get to when you hire somebody like you know hiring costs um, in terms of wages salaries everything else that goes around it like it's a, it's it's gonna you know really cost the business a lot of money and if you need if you need a lot of people then you know you're gonna need that right so yeah it's um, it's 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 it is a difficult one and I think you know people have been talking about it for years and you know we We've kind of seen incremental improvements, um, but I, I do think we're not there yet. I think there's, there's still a lot of work to do. Interesting. Um, we're actually coming up until about 45 minutes. This is the time where we usually kind of dig into a certain, a certain uh, party piece there for Mark Baker. Uh, he's got his, his, his quick fire round or lightning round. It's been called 
you know, it's like shark tips. It's been uh, called a lot of different <laughs> different things there. Uh, but basically, it's going to be a quick fire uh, question round. It doesn't have to be quick answers. In fact, long answers are usually the better ones. Uh, we found. I was going to say, I'm not very good at quick answers, so <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> so, what do you think, Mark Baker? Okay. So, Joe, what apps do you use, use the most on your, on your phone? On my phone, um, I would say, do you know what? Let me bring up my phone. I'll be able to tell you straight away. Um, so Slack, uh, WorkVivo, obviously, right? So WorkVivo, definitely is probably the most used app. Um, Slack, uh, Twitter. Um, interestingly, Viber. So for some reason, most of my family use Viber rather than WhatsApp. So I, that would be my... I didn't know people still use that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Both and both my family and my wife's family are uh, big Viber users for some reason. So um, Spotify, YouTube, um, Bear. So I use Bear for taking notes. Um, I've never heard of that one. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's a nice app, actually. They've got apps on, um, on Mac OS and, and then good apps on iPad and, and iPhone as well. We use Notion a lot in work um, for kind of collaborative documentation and so on. So um, Notion is, an, is another one. Probably not so much on my phone, but um, yeah, I think they're probably the the, the kind of main ones. I, I spend way too much time on Twitter, like just <laughs> crazy amounts of time just scrolling on Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, they're probably the, the main ones. Um, I've, exactly. I've become mad interested in YouTube as well over the last kind of, I think over the last two to three years, particularly, like I remember before wondering, you know, why, like I didn't really get YouTube is like, you know, I got it for, okay, hey, you wanted a specific video, you'd watch it. But like, the whole, you know, watching YouTube instead of watching TV or anything. Like I've, <laughs> I've kind of nearly gotten into that um, uh, over the last kind of couple of years where, you know, I just watch tons and tons of YouTube these I, days. So I love what, like, I'm obsessed with YouTube. I have it on most of the time. Say if I'm doing something that, where I'm, I'm just doing my, my work or whatever, I have another screen with some sort of YouTube thing on. It could be anything. Like, and it's kind of a pick your own adventure. That's what I really, really like. <laughs> I was watching TV the other day. I just turned it off and I like, started watching YouTube on my phone because I can pick whatever I want. And I'll, do, I'll be doing loads of different things. Like Mark makes fun of me because I, I watch these guys like My Wyoming Life, which is this like ranching daily vlog where the guy is like doing stuff on the ranch. Mark's like, that has nothing to do with your life. Like, what are you like wasting your time? But it's kind of just a nice, it's, it's a kind of a nice relaxed life in the background, you know, it kind of contrasts with working in technology yeah. and stuff like that. I wonder, is it, is it almost like a platform for guilty pleasures or something like that? It's um, like my, you like, I'm almost embarrassed by the channels I'm subscribed to in terms of their <laughs> level of geekiness. And, you know, like, so like I, one of the ones that I, I suppose most look forward to seeing new videos on is, is a channel called uh, LGR and it stands for lazy game reviews, but it's not really a gaming thing at all. It's basically a guy who gets like really old computer parts and builds old computers. Um, or restores old computers and installs really old opera. Like it's just so geeky. It's not even funny. It's like the production values are okay. It's like, but it's, yeah, it's, I, I don't know why I like, I don't build old computers myself at home or anything like that. I'm interested in it, but I don't do it. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I just love watching this. It's like it's things that, that are so niche, like they have huge followings as well. Like, so it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Like this guy has millions of followers, like That's are millions of subscribers on YouTube and um, people actually send him stuff. So they'll send him like computer parts or like old computer games that they had up in the attic and, you know, he would unbox them. And like, you know, basically it's a video of him opening a box that's been mailed to him and just picking, like taking things out, showing them to the camera and talking about it for a few minutes. Like if you actually, it's, it's a bit like Twitch, right? So it's like, I, I remember when I first heard the premise of Twitch, I was like, yeah, no, like it's, yeah. Just like who is going to watch somebody else playing a video? I mean, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't compute, right? And yet, it's like I actually quite enjoy watching people playing video games on Twitch, probably more so than actually playing video games myself. It's just bizarre. It's like if you if you went back ten years, you would never have predicted that this is the kind of thing that we would be watching today. What, what, one uh, of the worst things was sitting waiting for my brother to finish his go on the computer, and now people are just happy to watch other people play. Games. Yeah, it used to be there. If, if, say if you only had two <laughs> two joypads and then wait. Yeah. FIFA and you're waiting for your your half and something and like just going mad like I don't want to do that at all but <laughs> well, I guess uh, it, the way they the, the the games are it's kind of built for that as well it's kind of almost like you're yeah kind of following a story yeah and, and I suppose the big the, like the big personalities are like they're just that they're personalities right they're they're entertaining to 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 listen to and to and to watch on camp like you know some of the reactions they have to different events and so on are mm. like you, you, that's it's probably as much about that but I, like. I often wonder, like on the gaming thing particularly myself, is it like, is it almost like a, 
an increased laziness that we have is <laughs> that we're like, you know, we're, we're kind of interested in the stories behind the games and everything else, but we just couldn't be bothered playing them. So we just like, we're going to watch somebody else do it instead. <laughs> yes, like, like I, another one I like, I quite like to watch is uh, people living in vans or <laughs> tiny houses, that type of thing, like where they've designed their whole life around this van and stuff like that. Then I'll go down and talk, tell my wife about that. I'm like, is these guys, they've got it right there, hitting the road, and they live in a van. She goes, I don't know if that's something that you know I'd like to do, but I'm like, we should do that for a year. <laughs> and then she, um, some, somebody working here in Morfevo actually does that. Um, oh, really? So they, yeah, they, they did it, I think, towards the kind of start of the pandemic. They bought a van and, and they just like travel around in the van. And uh, yeah, we, we often laugh because like her 4G in the middle of nowhere is often a lot better than you know people you know connecting into zoom calls from home and so on so it's yeah. uh it's quite funny but uh, yeah, yeah that's I, I get it i get it <laughs> yeah. so i don't know so that, that was again that was uh you know, not really a lightning answer. We kind of, well, it was a collaborative. <laughs> I need, I I'll try to be more lightning with the next one. <laughs> I need to up my YouTube game. Jeez, I'm, too, I'm too basic watching Joe Rogan. Okay. Um, well, our next one is what, what's your favorite social media and why? But it's probably Twitter, is it? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I, 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 I'd love to say that I'm, you know, like well versed in IG and in TikTok and all these kind of platforms that are kind of the the, the new age, right? But yeah, I think it's probably just my age. I'm 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 a Twitter head. What's the best business idea you never acted upon? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I don't. I'm not sure. I never acted on, um, but I would say that. My, so the, like I mentioned a couple of times that I you know have failed at a startup before, um, Subwoofer, um, which is which was a music tech company, and I actually think that the original premise behind that is like is still a solid one, and it was just it's just a really hard space to execute well in, um, because of the dynamics of the industry and like the challenges of like, you know, you've got mega superstars on one end, and then you've got like artists really struggling, um, to even like you know put bread on the table at the other end of it from, from music. Um, so it's a really, really challenging industry, but it's one that like I still think about today, you know, and it's, uh, it's one that I'd love to crack if, 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 so yeah, maybe, maybe 10 years time, um, 20 years time, I'll, I'll, I'll have another go at the music business and see, can I, and what, can, I can I do something? What did the business do, Joe? So it's funny, like what the business did and what the business was supposed to do are probably two separate things, right? So the original vision for, for Subwoofer was like, this was at a time when, you know, okay, Spotify was, was, was kind of in full swing at this point, but, you know, there really was like this disparity between like the music business and, and like money, right? So the, the music business was just basically losing money hand over fist. And that was happening on a kind of a, a continual basis over the, over the 15 years prior. Um, and services like Spotify had popped up to kind of help like create a new revenue stream and things like that. But it was just so far away from what people like were earning, you know, from CDs and things like that before kind of piracy ruined all of that kind of thing. So the original premise for Subwoofer was that artists would be able to create a subscription service directly for their fans. So not too dissimilar to what you have at OnlyFans today um, or Patreon or, you know, these platforms where people can essentially, you know, pay a monthly subscription to a creator, essentially, right? And in, in Subwoofer's case, it was specifically musicians. Um, but I suppose what happens, I mean, like, firstly, music is a business where, you know, if you want to have any chance of success, you need funding and, like, not small funding. You need big funding. Um the other challenge is that if you're not targeting the top end of the market, if you're not targeting the major record labels, and there's a small number of them, so like if you don't win them, like you're not going to win any of the of the of the music industry. The other end of the spectrum is independents and and indie labels and so on, who are fantastic and creating enormous value in terms of the music that they're creating and, and their contribution from from an artistic perspective. But if you're trying to build a business targeting um, in, in independent artists and, and musicians it's incredibly challenging, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of where we found ourselves um, because our message, like our, our values were very tied to trying to help artists to make more money in, in, in the age of streaming and everything else. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is, is that you can't build a sustainable business trying to do that as well. It's, it's really, really difficult. So um, yeah, I think that's probably, you know, what I would say is I, I, I still think that's a, there's a big opportunity there. I think, you know, the original premise for Subwoofer itself, I think, you know, is, is solid enough, but I think, you know, if you look at it with, with the lens of where we are within the world today regarding, regarding music, 
you know, I probably would do something very different. Um, but I, I still think it's a big problem. I think like I have loads of thoughts on I talk about rapid fire, right? This is definitely like the opposite of rapid fire, but like music is really interesting to me because I think what's actually happened over the last number of years, and especially since, you know, amazing services like Spotify and, and, and Apple Music are, are out there and they're giving us basically the world's music at our, at our fingertips. It's phenomenal. But I think the negative impact of that has been, it's completely changed the dynamic of how we actually consume music. Um, so like typically people consume music in either a passive way or an active way. So like passively is it's on in the car, it's, you know, when you're at work, it's a, you know, when you're in the gym, you're kind of listening to music and you don't really necessarily care what you're listening to. You just want something to kind of, you know, pump you up or, you know, kind of drive you on or whatever. Um, and then there's active listening. And I, I think, you know, far less people in the world today are actually actively listening to music um, because the act of listening is, has become so less deliberate than it used to be. You know, before you'd have to take a CD out of your collection and open the case and take the CD out and put it into the drive and pick what song you want. You know, it was, it was a lot more investment that you had to make in order to listen to music. Whereas now I think it's so convenient that we've kind of lost that a lot. And um, yeah, so I, I, I would love to, you know, work on something. I, I, I still don't know what the absolute solution is. I, I know the person, like whoever gets it right is like, you know, going to do incredibly well. But it's, um, yeah, that's probably the one I would, I would say, even though it's not directly answering your question. <laughs> oh, very good. Very interesting. <laughs> Like the, I couldn't agree more. Like, remember when you used to get like a CD and then you'd, you'd sit down and you'd actually, whatever, it's probably like 50 minutes or something, and you'd listen to the whole thing. I don't think I've listened to something like that. Like, I, so on, on Spotify, that's what I use when I'm in the gym or when I'm walking or whatever. Um, and I use uh, my daily mix a lot mm. because it kind of, it does a good job at knowing what type of songs that I like. So it would just go through, but I'm not going like deep into an album. Do you like, uh, you know, I've got Bono behind me. You know, like that Octone Baby album where they, they the story behind it, where they're in Berlin just after the fall of the the wall and everything. The, yeah. And there's kind of they're trying to you know portray that through the album. I just think there hasn't I haven't had that experience in a long time. Um, no, and it, and it, and and that's that's exactly it. It's um it's it's that experience, and I think that's like we've seen a resurgence in vinyl, right? So vinyl, I think the other day it was reported that vinyl has actually surpassed CD sales now. Um, and it's, it's, it's because people have like people who are like fans, like, so people like not, not people who, you know, just throw on a playlist because they want to listen to something. It's people who actually are fans of specific artists and specific genres and so on. Like they want something tangible, you know, they want, and I think that's why digital has probably failed to kind of recapture that is because it's, it's an experience. It's, you know, it's not just a convenience. It's an, it's an actual kind of more of an experiential thing. Um, and that's why we've seen final research because, you know, like I, 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 I read some statistic that like, I, I can't remember what percentage, but like a, ver like a reasonably large percentage of the vinyl sold today will never be played. Um, and it's, it's people are buying it because they want to have a collection or they want to have a sense of ownership of something. And, you know, when you have streaming services like Spotify, like you don't feel like you own any of the music that you're, that you're listening to. Um, so yeah, I think like I, yeah, I could talk about I could talk about this for hours on end, and I have done in the past. And um, yeah, it didn't work out so well for me. So um, it's probably a good sign that I should sell away, to stay away, well away from it. But it's yeah, it's I I think I think it's because I'm like I love music, but I absolutely suck at creating music. Like I've tried playing instruments, terrible. I've tried doing music production, not no good. I can't sing to save my life. So like, there's literally no other avenue that I have to get into music other than software and code. Um, so I think that's why I'm like eternally drawn to it. And I think I always will be. Okay. Hey go. Mark, what do you think? A couple more? Yeah. Um, okay. How, here's one. How much money is enough money? <laughs> that's, that's a really good one, right? So it's funny because I, I, I've talked about this with my wife recently enough around like, I would say that like 10 years ago, I would have been quite like materialistic. I would have like, you know, looked at the future and said, yeah, I want to start a business and I want to sell it for loads of money. And I want to, you know, have holiday homes in multiple locations and, you know, like thinking really like about things and about ownership of things and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but it's funny, like now 
I have a totally different perspective on it. It's because I, you know, back then I had no children, right? So now I've got three kids and I like kids. And I know Luke, we were talking about how, you know, earlier on how, um, you know, kids just change your life. They do like genuinely, but not just in terms of like day-to-day impact, but also in terms of how you view the world. Um, so like genuinely the, like enough money for me is enough money where you don't need to worry about money. Um, so, you know, if you could like live your life without like having to, you know, worry about meeting the bills and things like that, like that's enough. I, I like, I, like, I, yeah, I mean, sure. You, you could have a lot more than that. And, and, you know, I think the next kind of level of it is, you know, can you provide for your children's future and, and make sure that they're safe and, and secure for, for their um, future. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, it really comes down to that. So I don't think it's, you know, Effect. mega mega it's not you don't need billions of dollars <laughs> like you know it's not it's not that level i think it's purely enough that just makes like worrying about your finances a, a non-event it's just not a thing um if like that's certainly where i'd love to get to in the next number of years is, is to a place where you know I, I i don't have to worry about money or think about it and um and, I, and then hopefully you know for my kids as well yeah i think there's a threshold and then anything after that's not going to make you any any more content no and i think it's it's funny because like we, we talked about um you know youtube and like myself and my wife are watching this thing on netflix at the moment um what's it called selling sunset um and it's like you know these guys selling homes in la and it's like you know there's this 40 million dollar house and i think there's another show that we were watching before that and it was like it was, it was a similar story but it was like set in the hamptons and you're, you're looking at this and it's like you know, you get into that world and it's like, there's always another rung on the ladder, right? There's always somebody who's got like, and I, I think, yeah, it's funny. I think, I think kids are a really great way of giving, giving you some perspective of like how none of that actually matters and is as important. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think, I think happiness is, is, you know, the first step to that is, is not having to worry about things. And if you can, you know, remove that barrier, then that's, that's yeah. kind of it. Yeah. So- it's, it's something that I just kind of uh, realized. We've done, like I said, we've, I, I think we, this is the V36 or 37 in our, well, maybe a little bit more, 38th episode or whatever. Um, and so we've actually interviewed probably 32, 33 people. Um, and there's a bit, there's kind of a big difference between the answers of people who have kids and who don't have kids. I know <laughs> no. <laughs> most, most people that have kids are like, you know, it's love to have kids, not to worry, you know, all that type of stuff very you know and then something like we asked one of our early guests uh kind of a younger guy um who doesn't have any kids uh and he's like he said how much is enough money and he goes 12 million like just straight away <laughs> and we were like okay <laughs> and then he goes yeah i'll just have this like he had a bathed up and it was very like he said uh about you know buying things that's how much he needs to buy everything he wants you know that type of thing so uh um, but uh, you know different and, and, and like there is a different like you can look at it in terms of okay like how much money will i need to put into like you know a, a bank account or like some kind of a, a deposit account that like generates a guaranteed amount of interest in a given year that is going to provide me with enough income on an annual basis that i could live for the rest of my life you can work at it that way too um but i think like the number isn't like it's a it's a high number but it's not it's not crazy high either you know i think it's it's probably attainable for a lot of people who are, who are, you know, in business and, and starting companies and so on. Um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. I think the number is going to be high, but it's trying not to kill yourself. Achieving that it defeats the whole purpose, you know? Yeah. And even if you get part of the way there, it's like, it's going to take a massive amount of stress away. Right. So like, yeah, I think you just try and enjoy, enjoy the wins if, when you get to them and, and, um, you know, if you do ultimately get to your goal on, on, on the financial side of things, then fantastic, you know, but it's, yeah. um, yeah. The journey. Exactly. So a couple more, is it who, is it who, you know, or is it what, you know? <laughs> depends. So that's a perfect answer, right? It depends. I think, I think at the start of anything, um, so whether it's a startup or a company or, um, you know, when you're learning, you know, you know, something around that, I think it's, who you know i think you know it's like that 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 it is for me and i think then you know as you kind of mature into like whether it's a business or whatever it's probably you know what you know then at that point so i'm going to keep that one really brief (laughs) (laughs) okay um if you could advise someone to learn one skill what would it be 
okay so obviously my bias towards like software engineering is going to come out here but i think yeah learning to code i think is is definitely something i would recommend to anybody who's like got anything more than a passive interest in technology because it enables you i guess not like just to think about problems and solutions but actually like how to implement solutions to like technology and, and, and software and so on, right? And it just, I think, you know, especially the world that we live in today, it's, it just opens up so many opportunities. Um, and, you know, I think there's, you know, a lot of really great career paths that can come out of um, being a coder and, and being, a, being a software engineer. Um, it doesn't need to be your forever thing, but you learn so much about how things work under the hood of, of technology and, and all the technology that we use today that, you know, it's, 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 it's massively valuable. Um, I think it's like the other things, the other reasons I'd say code is because it's so accessible. You know, er, anybody can learn to code. Like there's infinite free resources online for you to go at. You don't need fancy computers. You don't need, you know, to spend a ton of money on courses and all of that. Like there's enough information out there that you can actually, if you decided to over the next number of months, you could, you could learn to code. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I, that, that would be my advice. I think people think it's probably too difficult. It's probably not. Maybe it's not as difficult as, as people think. Is that would that be right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely challenging. Um, you know, there's and you, and I think you need to probably have a certain mindset. You know, I think you know if you're logical and you think about things logically, I think you know it definitely helps. If you're, you know, like, I don't think you need to be an honors math student or anything like that to do it. It's not it's not like that. But I think the the that perception that it's like it's too difficult is i don't think that's correct like I, I think you know it's it's a journey to like you know mastery is is like it's a it's a lifelong journey right so i, I would consider myself a master of code or by any stretch of the imagination i'm still learning i'm still evolving i'm still improving um so yeah i think i think that mindset is is, is mostly false i think you know the, the foundations and the basics are like probably a little bit harder to learn than maybe other disciplines um but it shouldn't be a roadblock to getting started. And I think often as well, like the way that we like teach people to code, like in like an education context. So like if you've got, you know, people going to college and, and learning to code that way, it's, it's almost too, um, it's, it's not based in like real world challenging problems, a bit like school, right? I mean, it's like, you know, if, if we made maths a lot more interesting for kids, I think, you know, they wouldn't find it so hard. Um, <laughs> And it's the same with code. It's like if you can present kids or or anyone um, with a problem that they find interesting, and sh you know show them the pathway to solving that with code, like mm -hmm. th their natural interest in solving the problem is going to help them to learn. Um, so yeah, I think you know I th I think the perception that it's it's easy, like it's definitely not easy, you know. And I think you know it's not e like it's it's so vast, like it's a very big space. Like there's a lot of different ways to do everything, and you know there's a lot of things you can do. You can do mobile development, you can do web development, you know, you can build apps for for computers, you can you know build video conferencing tools. You can, like there's just so many different technologies and things that you you could learn. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the hardest thing is actually knowing where to start. But I think the the biggest thing to do is just what's the problem that you have how do we solve it with code? I think I also think that there's like, there's, it's not a new movement, but it's, it's something that's been kind of gathering pace over the last number of months is this whole kind of concept of no code. And you know, that you, um, and I, I actually think this is going to like, people t talk about, oh, is it going to, you know, mean that people don't need to learn how to program and how to code in the, in the future? Oh, it's not, I mean, really what I, I see it as more of an introduction to um, thinking like a, a coder. Um, because essentially what you're doing is you're, you're, you're starting with a problem and you're trying to cobble together a solution using loads of different tools. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that will help a lot because it takes a lot of the complexity and, chat and, and difficulty out of it, but it gets you into that mode of thinking where, yeah, this is how I would use different tools logically to, to achieve a solution to this problem. Okay. So, Mark, we'll get your, your daughters on the, the coding stuff. I sent, uh, I sent Layla... Uh, a Python book there recently. Yeah, she's there she's go. been learning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. She's really into it. So that helps. Again, it helps if they're yeah. kind of have that mindset. And you don't have to force them to do it. Um, okay, last one. Is there any one book that had an impact on you that you'd recommend to to people? Um, so I'm kind of a sporadic reader, right? I, I I'll go in fits of like reading nonstop and then not read again for like nine or ten months. Um. 
the book that's probably had the biggest impact on me recently was um, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. He's the creator of Nike. Um, it's just fascinating, fascinating story for anybody who's like interested in like business and how companies get started and especially a company like Nike. So, um, so yeah, like if, if, if somebody was asking me for a book recommendation right now, it would probably be that one. It's, it's, a, and it's, you can, you can find it anywhere. Right. So it's, there's definitely code books that I think won't be applicable to the vast majority of your audience. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't go there. <laughs> no, that's, I've, that's a book that a few people have mentioned to me. Uh, in yeah, general. Um, I'm surprised I haven't read it yet. Um, we do have one more question. We'd like to thank you very much for joining us on the Shark Pod uh, here today. And I know we've kind of a quick fire round went on for 25 minutes as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at these guys, but I, I know it was really, really interesting uh, to have a chat with you. Um, we, you know, work for you. It's going to be a huge uh, success story. We're very uh, kind of uh, all over that. But uh, there's one more question. Would you prefer a t shirt like this? Or a mug, oh, a shark yeah. pod mug. Yeah, we, we've got a couple of different designs. Ooh. A or a mug. I would say a mug. Okay. I actually... Yeah, mug. I drink an awful lot of coffee, so... Um, and I don't have a lot of mugs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have mug. a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> Mark, I think the mug is pretty cool as well. People usually go for the t-shirt, but um, we'll, get the, we'll get the mug out to you. Uh, I can I'll, see that. One I'll of happily that. take both guys, so... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how many listeners we get on this one. <laughs> All, right. All right. So thanks very much. And we'll leave it there for today. Talk soon. Thanks, Emil. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on.